it's Sarah. I open my eyes and let them adjust to the darkness of the early morning and wonder if I should rise and dress. I am always awake before the dawn. I prop myself up on my pillows and look across the beds of strangers to where Maddie lies sleeping. I have never had to sleep with strangers. When we readied for bed last night, there was a chilling silence throughout the room as the woman in the black dress and a younger woman dressed in brown pointed out the nightgown placed on each bed and then stood at the center of the room until all of us readied for bed. All of us strangers readying for bed together in silence. And then the woman in the black dress told us to kneel for our bedtime prayers, and many of the other children stood still, silently staring at the floor, until she pointed at those of us who knew, who understood, who did what it was she wanted. But while she shouted out some words whose meanings meant nothing to me, I asked the Creator to help me be good so that we could someday go home. But then I thought about home, and so I added that I was thankful for all that Mother Earth has given to us, and thankful that our Father is doing what is best for us. And when I was done, I waited and waited and waited for the woman in the black dress to finish, and when she was, Maddie and I and some of the other children rose instantly to our feet, and soon the others followed. And now I am awake while all the strangers are still sound asleep, and so is Maddie, but Maddie is in her own bed now. When the two women turned out the lights last night and closed the door behind them, only seconds of silence filled the room before I heard the muffled sounds of tears echoing my own. And only seconds more went by before I heard the creaking of springs and sensed Maddie standing beside me. Shh, she whispered as she lifted the blanket and slid into my bed and laid her left arm gently across my waist. We won't cry, she scolded softly in my ear. I pressed my face into the pillow and silenced my sobs. And with my sister's forehand pre forehead pressed against my back, I fell asleep listening to the muffled sounds of tears echoing those in my heart. And now Maddie is in her own bed, sleeping, and I wonder if I should rise and dress. Maddie. Maddie? I hear a voice far away in the distant corners of my head. It is Sarah whispering softly, and for just a moment I think we are at home. But as I peer through my partially opened eyes, I see Sarah standing beside me, wearing a drab brown dress that makes my younger sister look old and dreary. Where's her blue dress that she hung on the peg when we went to bed? For just a moment, I think I am dreaming. Maddie, Maddie, get up, Sarah says. She tugs at my shoulder, pulling the coarse gray blanket back, letting the morning chill creep in. It is no dream. As I lift myself up slowly to stretch out the stiffness of sleep, my brain bolts at the sound of a voice sharply barking commands. What's this? What's this? Not ready? Before I am even out of my bed, before my eyes have adjusted to the dimness of the morning light, Sarah hands me a pile of clothes, a pile of dark, drab dreariness that matches what I see her wearing, and with an almost tearful hurry, she vanishes from my side. Come, come, girls, line up! I frantically pull on the long black stockings as a blur of blackness appears beside me, but I am hurrying too much to look up, and besides, I do not need to look to know it is the woman in the black dress. Matilda Tarbell! She knows my name. She knows who I am. I do not remember her name, but I know who she is. The first step to becoming a productive person, Matilda, is learning to follow rules, and rising and being ready to start the day with everyone else is the first rule here. I am hurrying to start the day, but it is already too late. Perhaps I can pretend, pretend I do not understand her. So many children here do not. Speak English now. They will expect it. Do you understand? She demands, wrapping her stick against the palm of her hand. I do not want to feel the shame of her stick. Yes, ma'am, I understand. I will try to be good, father. I will. Sarah. Hold still. A bigger girl and older than I am that I am, says as she brushes my hair hard against my head, the bristles scraping sharply against my skin. I can brush my own hair, my hair that is longer and darker than even Maddie's, my hair that is almost as long as my mother's was, my hair that flows down my back and stays away from my face with the two combs that my mother bought for me my birthday when I was ten. Sometimes when I was angry at Maddie because she was so bossy, my mother would nod and smile and slide the combs away and run her fingers through my hair and tell me how she was making peace for me and Maddie. But when the great law of peace was created, Hiawatha and the peacemaker had to comb out the snakes from the hair of Tadohoa, the great chief. We would sit together on the wooden steps of our porch, and as her fingers fell through my hair, 
so would my anger fall away, and I would be at peace with my sister once more. But here in this room full of strangers, I feel no peace. My hair is being pulled and pinned and twisted and turned and knotted until I feel a lump hand in my hair being pressed into the back of my neck. You will have to learn to do this for yourself, the voice behind me commands. I say nothing. Maybe she should have it cut, Ida, another voice adds, causing me to leap forward from the wooden stool so quickly that I almost fall to the floor. Now look what you've done, says an angry voice that must be Ida. I'll have to start again, she adds as she pulls me by the hair back up onto the stool. A dozen eyes stare at me from the bench along the wall, eyes that belong to girls who watch and wait, one girl holding on to the ends of her long black braids with fists clenched tightly against her chest, another leaning so far forward she surely will fall, the other shrinking back into the wooden wall behind them. A dozen eyes stare at me, but none of them belong to Maddie, my older sister. Where is my older sister? Maddie. I lift my spoon and let the broth drip back into the bowl. There's nothing in the bowl except brown liquid. The girl across from me smiles and lifts her spoon. Soup, she whispers. I know it is soup. I know, I say. I stir my spoon slowly and stare into the metal bowl, wondering where the rest of the soup might be. You speak English, she says. She sounds surprised. Yes, I answer. So many don't, you know, she says, lowering her voice as though she has revealed some great secret to me. Sarah and I can speak English, if we try, if we want to. It's not very good, is it, she says. Is it, she says. At first I think she means my English. Then I see she is nodding her head downward toward the bowl, and I know she means the soup. I shake my head. No, I agree, it isn't. There's nothing in it, she nods. My grandmother makes the best soup you have ever tasted, she says quietly, looking around as though she wants no one else to hear. It takes a long time to make, and has corn and beans. Mine did too, I interrupt. Her eyes meet. I'm Gracie, she says. Perhaps I have a friend. Sarah. Ruthie, our teacher says. Stand up. Stand up, Ruthie, she says again louder. No one moves. I try to look around the room without looking around the room to see who should be standing up. I cannot remember who was named Ruthie. No one in the room stands up. No one moves. Soon our teacher steps toward a small girl whose face is buried in her arms, which are folded on the wooden desk, two rows away from me. She does not see the teacher coming, and so I hold my breath for her. But the teacher does not have a stick in her hand like the woman in the black dress, and when she is beside the girl's desk, she does not strike her. Instead, she touches her lightly on the shoulder, and her voice is soft when she speaks, not sharp like the woman in the black dress. Ruthie, she says, tapping her finger on top of the girl's shoulder several times. Ruthie, she says, stand up. The girl lifts her head so slowly, showing no surprise, showing no fear. So I think she must have heard the teacher's voice, must have heard her movement, must have known she was there. But when this girl looks up from where she sits, her dark eyes, browner than even my own, stare into the eyes of the teacher, and the skin on her forehead crinkles questioningly toward her. Ruth E, the teacher repeats firmly, her finger tapping one, two, three times where the paper is pinned to Ruthie's desk. Stand up, please, Ruth E. And now she takes her elbow and gently lifts her to her feet so that she is standing beside the wooden desk. But as Ruthie rises, her head drops and her eyes drift downward until her chin rests almost on her chest. Our teacher puts her hand under Ruthie's chin and lifts her head until their eyes meet again. Ruth E. E, she says once more, and nods her head. The teacher wants her to say her name, her new name, her school name, but Ruthie says nothing. Maddie and I did not need new names. Our teacher liked our names. She said they were good names, that our parents gave us good names. She does not even know, and we will not tell her, that we have other names, other names which are special names. When Father told us we were going away, going far away from home to school, he said we should only tell our English names. He said her Mohawk names are special, and we should keep them for special times. Maddie. My father said, you will go to school. He said, they will teach you what you must learn. I said I could learn just as well if I stayed home. He could teach me. My father said, you must go to school. Life will be better for you. It is for the best. So we came to school because he said it would be best. 
best for me and best for Sarah, best for our brothers and sisters who went to other schools, some closer to home, some farther away than Sarah and I are now. But the first thing we learned was how to march. If I wanted to march, I would have joined the army and become a soldier like Uncle Lewis, my father's brother, who is, in, who is as young as my oldest brother, except maybe, just maybe, father would have been even more sad. When Uncle Lewis told us he had decided to join President Taft's army, father shook his head and his eyes filled with sadness. As we stood in the front yard and watched Uncle Lewis leave, catching a ride with the milk wagon heading to town and to the train station and to President Taft's army, wherever that was, father shook his head and shook his head and his eyes filled with sadness. When the milk wagon melted into the sun, father turned and walked through the field of uncut hay to the edge of the river and stood there for hours and hours and hours. I wonder, I wonder if father walked through the field behind our house to the edge of the river and stood there for hours and hours and hours. When Sarah and I left for this school, I wonder if father knew that when we came to school we would learn how to march like Uncle Lewis. I wonder if our brothers and sisters who went to other schools learned how to march. When we rise at dawn, we march to our morning meal. When that meal is done, we march to our lessons. When we finish our lessons, we march to our midday meal. When the meal is done, we march to our work. And on and on we march throughout the day. Today, Miss Prentice, who shows us how to use a machine that sews our clothes, made us march around the room. We marched and marched to stretch our legs, she said, so we could pump the pedal that turns the wheel which moves the needle up and down. If I thought marching all day would stretch my legs and make me tall, I would march and march and march. But marching only makes me tired. Sarah Sitting at my desk, I feel its woodenness against my elbows and the backs of my knees. My legs ache to run through the fields, searching for strawberries, even though the berries have long been gone from the fields at home, replaced by the black-eyed Susans found scattered behind our home, black-eyed Susans that my arms long to pick. Sarah, I hear a voice call, and for a mere moment I think is my mother calling me from the fields. But it is not my mother. It is Miss Weston who wants my attention. Sarah, she calls again, it is your turn to read. I slowly rise to my feet, dreading the task. I like to read, and I am becoming a better reader, but it is hard to read English, and I do not want to stand beside my desk and read aloud while other students stare, even though I know they stare, because they do not know what I read. I open the book and begin. But it is hard to read when you are looking at words in English and thinking of strawberries in the fields at home. Speak up, Sarah, Miss Winston says, Weston insists. My heart jumps into my mouth, and so I stop reading as my eyes search frantically over the words which have become a blur of blackness. I have lost my place, I whisper, closing my eyes quickly, hoping the words will have become untangled when I look again. But when I open my eyes, I see Miss Weston's hand draped over the top of my book, pointing to a place on the page where I must begin. Start here, she says, firmly, but not unkindly. I wish I could like Miss Weston, but I do not think Miss Weston likes me. Maddie says I should be good for Miss Weston, which should make me laugh because Miss Weston is the only person Maddie is good for. Maddie. Miss Weston. She is the nicest teacher in the whole school. She returned the piece I had written about the baskets my mother made, and at the top of the paper, in beautiful handwriting, she had written... How beautifully you write. Sarah, I say. Miss Weston is the only teacher, the only teacher in the whole school. She looks up at me. Her big brown eyes opened wide in her very typical Sarah. What are you talking about? Look, we have lots of teachers, she says. I sigh. It is so, Sarah. Too many teachers, she adds, shaking her head from side to side. Sarah likes to learn, but she does not like our teachers. She says they scold and scowl and make us stand to speak or read, but never share our thoughts. I like to know, but I do not always like to learn what others think I should. And, like Sarah, I do not like the teachers either, except Miss Weston, who does not scold or scowl. Except Miss Weston, who looks at us when she asks us to stand and speak or read. Except Miss Weston, who says I write beautifully. But look, I say. I hold out my paper so she can share my pride as we sit by si side by side on her bed. So, she replies sharply. With a shrug of her shoulders, she rises quickly from the bed and stands by the window, pretending that something outside draws her deep attention. I glance down to see the edge of a paper peeking out from under her book. I slide it out carefully, quietly. You can do better. I still think Miss Weston is the best teacher, the very best teacher in the whole school. 
Sarah is just jealous. Sarah. Swish, swish, swish. Sweep of the broom against the rough stone steps brushes against my ears. I peer through the partly open window, stained and straight with the dirt of years, and watch as Mr. Davis pulls the broom back and forth across the steps in strong strokes. Swish, swish, swish. No one calls me Mr. Davis, he told me yesterday when I thanked him for fixing the handle on my bureau. I's just Davis. De ain't never been a Miss De Davis in my family, not ever. And then he laughed quietly and shook his head from side to side, and I wondered what I had said, what I could have said that amused him so. Davis? The sharpness of the voice caught me by surprise, but I did not need to turn my head to know that Mrs. Dwyer had entered the room. She stood just inside the doorway and peered over the tops of the tiny glasses she sometimes wears, closely examining the space where the door meets the wall. It looks to me like your job in here is finished, she said coldly. Yes, am Mr. Davis answered quickly. The laughter had left his voice, and when he left the room, his head hung so low that his chin almost rested on his chest, and when he passed, Mrs. passed by Mrs. Dwyer, she wrapped her ruler tap, tap, tap against the palm of her hand and scowled at him, and after he had left, she turned her head toward me and scowled at me. Girls, line up for dinner, she demanded, wrapping her ruler tap, tap, tap against the palm of her hand. Thank you, Mr. Davis, I mouthed soundlessly as I watched him sweeping the dirt off the steps. Swish, swish, swish. Thank you for being my friend. Maddie. Miss Weston said my essay was so good it should be printed in the arrow. She said she would show my essay to the man on the bandstand, and then she whispered to me that the man on the bandstand who puts our paper in print was not a man at all, but a very nice woman and someone who would like my essay. Then Mrs. Dwyer found out her plan. She was very, very angry, angrier than I have ever seen her, and I have seen Mrs. Dwyer very angry. In a very stiff voice, Mrs. Dwyer said, We need essays on moral instruction more than we need essays on baskets. And Mrs. Dwyer said she would tell the man on the bandstand that my essay, my beautiful essay about my mother's baskets, was not to be printed my heart fell into my feet, and if I had not told Sarah that we would not, we were not to cry, I would have shed a thousand tears. I didn't tell Sarah. I told Gracie, Gracie Palace, whose bed is next to mine, because Sarah could not have that bed. Mrs. Dwyer would not let her, and now Gracie is my friend, maybe my best friend. The night before the morning that I gave my essay to Miss Weston, I read it aloud to Gracie, because Gracie doesn't read very well. When she heard what I had written, she leaned forward on her bed and sighed and said she wished she could write like I do. She said my writing was good, so good that if she closed her eyes and listened to my words, she could almost see the baskets, the beautiful baskets that my mother made. So when I told Gracie that Mrs. Dwyer was angry and would not let Miss Weston put my essay in the school paper, she said she felt like crying. That is when I knew what Mrs. Dwyer said didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. Because Gracie, whose bed is next to mine, had become my friend, my best friend.